This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Microsoft Surface Pro 8, otherwise known as, you know, the one with the kickstand. So, goodness gracious, we've had just about a decade of these, and I'm kind of known as the Surface Lady because I like them before it everybody else kind of started to fall in love with them but they haven't been doing much in the last couple of years they kind of look the same iterative you get the idea so finally there's quite a few changes including a redesign i mean the basic idea and form factor are the same but you get a bigger screen you get smaller bezels you get more powerful graphics and thunderbolt Four. yay we are going to look at it now so it's available in your choice of platinum which is silver or graphite which is matte black but this time they're using anodized aluminum and no more magnesium alloy whatever so it doesn't show fingerprints as much the black model which is pretty nice that used to be a problem it got a little bit heavier compared to last generation though 1.96 pounds tablet only versus 1.7 the metrically inclined can see on screen the metric weights there still under a kilogram in weight though so on the light side and also still as always with the surface pro family the complaint here is the keyboard and the pen are not included they are an extra spend i'll get into whinging about the prices soon that's you know one of the few things i really fault microsoft for or complain about I fault them i don't know so much but these are not inexpensive products however they are solid usable products that can stand in for a laptop given the physical design in most ways and have the same horsepower as a 13 or 14 inch ultrabook in a more diminutive size and that's pretty darn appealing and goodness knows there have been enough clones from no-name clones of plenty to dell has a latitude that's basically a knockoff of this lenovo has a thinkpad that is basically a clone of this that speaks to the fact that people still do still like this design the design is a lot more like Surface Pro X, which was a better looking tablet with smaller bezels, uh, that nice matte black look, and a bit of a curve around the edges. So easier to hold, looks a little nicer besides, but most especially it doesn't dig into your hand. So that's nice because I could never personally be a Surface Pro X person because the whole canoodle of dealing with ARM and compatibility and performance wasn't so much for me. And also I like the bigger screen on the Surface Pro X. And now we've got a 13 inch instead of that 12.3 inch display. It's still IPS. It's still what they call pixel sense at Microsoft. PPI stays the same as last generation. Resolution is 2880 by 1920. So it's certainly high enough resolution given the size of the display. Obviously it supports touch and the new Slim Pen 2, which is that carpenter pencil kind of like design. So they've updated it. I'll talk about that. It's actually pretty cool. You can get it with a Core i5 or a Core i7. These are quad-core Ultrabook CPUs, which means 15 to 25 watts anomaly and performance. In fact, is like any other Ultrabook with an Intel 11th Gen CPU and Intel Iris Xe graphics. The Intel Iris Xe graphics gives you a nice boost over the old Intel UHD graphics. We have low power DDR4X RAM soldered on board, dual channel. Starts at eight gigs this time. No more four gigs for the consumer models anyway. Or you can get with 16 or you can get with 32 gigs of RAM. And for SSDs, you can go anywhere from a 128 to a 256 to a 512 gigabyte SSD or even a one terabyte. And that is a socketed M.2 2230. So it's the half height, harder to find SSD. There's the gotcha with that, but it joins Surface Pro X and Surface Laptop 3 and 4 for having, well, you can actually at least upgrade or replace this, the storage on this if you want to. Speeds on the storage on our model, which is a 256 gig Core i5. Okay, nothing impressive. PCIe 3 speeds here. It is NVMe, but not class leading. And for the prices they charge, I'm a little miffed at that. Yes, I am. Even if most of you probably won't notice the difference so much there about having the fastest SSD or not. What miffs me a little bit more is the display, which is actually quite nice to look at. If you sit back and start testing it by watching movies, you'll go down the rabbit hole. This looks really nice. I want to keep going. So take it with a grain of salt. It's not that bad either. Resolution is fine on this. It is a glossy display still, so there is some glare on it. But um, the color gamut on this, we have full sRGB. We're pushing into the 80s for P3 and Adobe RGB. And for this price, and given the fact that this is marketed in part to creators, I would like to see full P3 coverage to be competitive with some of the higher end displays. Wouldn't it be neat if this could be OLED or mini LED like the 12.9 inch iPad Pro? Should it be for this price? I kind of think so. I do. While we're talking about pricing, it starts at $1,099, call it $1,100, and it gets you a Core i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gig SSD, which is a darn small SSD by today's standards. We used to see it start at 
cheaper, like 750 with a Core i3, but now only the business line is getting that option there, probably because it was kind of uh, underpowered and uh, most consumers probably didn't buy that model anyway. I'm not going to miss the Core i3 configuration. We have the Core i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and the 256 gig SSD, which is $1,200. And for $1,200, I'm kind of a little annoyed that I'm only getting 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, which sort of sounds like I'm talking about Mac laptops when I complain about such things. It's not upgradable RAM either. So, you know, I think a lot of people probably would like to have 16 gigs of RAM to be up there with their, what you can get for an XPS 13 these days without blowing the bank, you know, all that sort of thing. But if you want to get into those higher-end models, like a Core i7, 16 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, you're looking at 1600 You can blow all the way up, way over $2,000 with this, depending on how you want to configure if you go for like a terabyte SSD. LTE will be coming later this year, probably around December, Microsoft says. So for right now, it's Wi-Fi only. Happily, that Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi 6 Intel is a X201 car with Bluetooth 5.1. So for those of you who always hated the old Marvel Avastar Wi-Fi adapter that they used with Surface Pros, it's gone. No more of those. Well, we're getting back to pricing for a little bit. Of course, this is a Surface Pro, so the price is never the price because most people want to use this with a keyboard. So the type cover, which is a new connector, new design, and it's compatible with Surface Pro X, but not with Surface Pro 7. So you do have to go out and get a new keyboard if you want to upgrade from a Surface Pro 7. That's 179 bucks for the type cover. If you want it with the pen, and it has a neat little tray for charging the new pen, that's $279, you get the pen and the keyboard. If you buy the pen separately, it's $130. So if you got your heart set on the pen, you might as well just get the type cover with the pen bundle, obviously. And there's still a fingerprint scanner keyboard that's $200. So your spend is obviously going to be around up to $300 more if you want the keyboard and the pen in addition to the base price. So there's that. Both the Core i5 and the Core i7 have fans. I have not really heard them much, so not an issue here. And there is ventilation all around the edges. I haven't felt hot air blowing on it. And holding it in my hands when doing things like using Adobe Photoshop to ed edit photos or to do drawings with many layers, the things that would get a surface hot on the back, it gets warm. It didn't get as hot. So the cooling is quite effective here, and the Intel 11th Gen CPU seems to be managing. Performance levels are pretty good on it. Again, it's the same as any 13-inch laptop that you're going to buy these days from the Intel side of the field in Windows land, so that's pretty good. And, you know, there is AMD to consider, too, and Apple's M1, but just keeping an Intel right now, performance is good on this. I think for the target audience, which is mostly people looking for an ultra-portable laptop where they can use a pen and can take notes, you've got more than enough horsepower now. You can even do some occasional video editing if you want it, even though I prefer a mobile workstation if you're going to be doing that a lot of the time. So this runs Windows 11 out of the box. Now, I never even did a video on Windows 11 because mostly it's just a facelift on top of Windows 10. And I do like the look of it. And you can do things like put the whole taskbar back to the left where it used to be if you feel more comfortable doing that instead of centered. In fact, I've done that. The dialogues look a little bit more modern. The icons are quite flat. You get the idea. And you can still go down and drill into certain settings and see things that probably date from the what, Windows 7 era almost, you know. But mostly they've done a good job with that. And I haven't had any compatibility issues with games or Adobe apps or any of the kinds of stuff that we run on our laptops these days. So that stuff is all good. For ports, we have two Thunderbolt 4 ports. So, you know, it used to be such a headache, and there was that Surface dock that was always finicky if you wanted multiple external monitors and all that. Now, that stuff gets to be a whole lot easier. So you want two external 4K displays? Yes, you can do that. You can have that without going crazy. You can hook it up to a Thunderbolt 3 or a Thunderbolt 4 dock. You can even use it with an eGPU. Yes, that actually works if you actually want to game on this. Um, yeah, to me, this is not a hardcore gaming product by any means, but that certainly does transform what you could do with it, which is nice. The bad thing is it is dongle life for you. There's no more USB-A port. Obviously, the mini display port was whacked a while ago and was replaced by USB-C with the Surface Pro 7, but yeah, we do still get a headphone jack, though. The micro SD card slot sadly is gone, creators, so...
The new type cover is quite good. It's now got carbon fiber inside. I, I've always liked the type covers. Some people do, some people don't. I think most people are okay with them. It's decent key travel. It's a white backlit keyboard, but it's a little bit less noisy now when you type. You know, it had that hollow kind of whack, 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 whack thing going on that can really annoy folks around you. So there's less of that. The trackpad click and the Microsoft Precision trackpad is still on the loud side for those of you who click instead of just tapping on it. And it's still not a very big trackpad, but it works really well. Now the pen, I was really surprised by the slim pen too. I know it had haptic feedback and stuff like that. This isn't like your phone vibrating in a dumb way. It actually tries to mimic in apps that support it like Sketchable and Microsoft Journal, which is pretty cool. This is not a journal from 10 years ago. Go check it out. It's supposed to be coming to Adobe Fresco and more apps support for it. Now what it's supposed to do is actually make it feel like you are sketching or painting or whatever it is or writing on the glass and it actually works now if you watch my channel you know that I do a lot of tech for artists and I love to do art on iPads on Wacom Cintiqs and all that sort of thing Surface Pro has never been my favorite between the skatey pen on the glass and the kind of jittery diagonal line issues and stuff like that and the lack of a good feel wasn't my favorite well this has changed things a lot first off diagonal lines have gotten a lot more stable the slow diagonal line test the fast ones are always fine I, the feedback and the fact that the nib is now much more grippy so you're not skating on the glass it's much more grippy than an iPad Pro for example with an Apple pencil really helps and then you get this feedback and when you're using a paintbrush it kind of feels like a sloshy slightly yet grabby feeling you switch to a pencil and it's more like scratchy and you switch to the eraser and you kind of feel it scrubbing <laughs> you know the, the tactile feel makes it surprisingly much easier to do visual art when you're mimicking natural media's physical experience. Now, the only time you'll feel a haptic buzz that kind of reminds you of your phone or something like that is in some apps, if you switch between tools, it'll do a vibrate just like a <laughs> to let you know that you've switched tools. And there is a control panel that lets you set the amount of haptic feedback that you get from the pen. The default is 50%. I like it at about 75%. Depends on how sensitive your hands are to these things. I leave that up to you. This is a rechargeable pen again, so you just drop it in that slot on the keyboard and you can recharge it. Another thing that helps with the drawing and the writing experience is the new 120 hertz refresh display. So just like we said with Apple and ProMotion, I, if the screen is redrawing faster to, to follow what you're doing with your lines, because a lot of us do sketch fast or write fast, it seems more immediate and more responsive. So that's a good thing. So that's another nice feature for Surface Pro 8. Now the only thing is, out of the box, because they want you to get better battery life, I guess, and they have to make you work for it if you want it, you actually have to go into display settings and then advanced display display settings, which is where you then get to see more elaborate dialogues, and then you can switch it to 120 hertz. Now Microsoft said variable refresh is coming, so you're not wasting your screen refresh cycles, but that might not happen until maybe the end of the year with an update. The display, by the way, also supports Dolby Vision for HDR. We have Dolby Atmos Sound. And the speakers on this, given the size of the tablet, are quite good. There's actually some bass. You know, don't expect it to rumble because this is a under two pound tablet, but it's pretty good. It's good enough to actually enjoy watching movies on. So how about battery life? In the Surface Pros have never had the greatest battery life, not atrocious, but somewhere in between. And now we have a 51.5 watt hour battery and it comes with a 65 watt charger. Yay that. And well, battery life depends on whether you're at 60 hertz or 120 hertz. Typically you lose about an hour of battery runtime by running at 120 hertz. Again, if they get that variable refresh working, probably the hit will be less. So running it at 60 hertz, just like older Surface Pros would have been, I've been averaging about eight and a half hours of battery life with the display set at 200 nits of brightness. And obviously the display can go way brighter than that. So if you're one of those people that likes to amp up the brightness, you might get shorter run times too. But I'm using it with a mix of light office and productivity tasks, just a little bit of Photoshop. So if you tend to be pretty light on stuff and not do anything using the Intel Iris XC graphics, you might do better than that. Now I got seven hours running it at 120 hertz under the same scenario. So there's that. So that's the Microsoft Surface Pro 8 for 2021. And Finally, a whole laundry list of improvements here, modernizations like Thunderbolt 4, 120 hertz display, which is something you don't usually see except on gaming laptops. And now we have better pen performance to the point where I actually like it for drawing now. So that's a lot to like. 
I would say that the Surface Pro line is still a niche product, but a lot of people want them and buy them. So I don't think it really is that niche. This is really for people who are into note-taking or art and who want something really crazy powerful that still might fit in a hotel safe, you know, which many of your laptops are not going to do. It's really portable. As always, the biggest caveat other than, you know, you have to be okay with the kickstand digging into your legs sometimes is the price. It ain't cheap, but it never has been. So no surprise. Not least from my old tech review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit the notification bell so you know about them.